Um, there is a review uh, that has been underway for um, quite some time, since about 2011, when the, um, the, the um, new Minister for uh, Agriculture and um, Forestry at the time, um, now it's the Ministry for Primary Industries, which um, gives us some sense of what the primary objectives of the, of the Ministry are. Um, shortly after um, taking his uh, position as a Minister, um, he was um, caught up in the, in the scandal um, over uh, sow crates um, and when Mike King exposed to national media um, just the sort of appalling conditions that um, millions of farmed animals in New Zealand are kept under. And, um, and, and after that he ordered a review shortly after. So that's been a thing that's been ongoing and is, is still ongoing. Seems to have been essentially concluded. We haven't seen any legislation or anything come up yet. Um, so in talking about the review, what I'll be doing tonight is walking you through the Act as it exists. Um, and I'll be bearing in mind something that my um, thesis supervisor uh, told me, um, that his PhD thesis supervisor told him about lawyers and the way they talk about things. And he said that lawyers have a way of talking about things that everybody's interested in, in a way that nobody is interested in. So I'll try to bear that in mind and, uh, and, and keep, it, keep it relatively light and, and accessible. Oh, we seem to have lost the slideshow there. There we go. Okay, so we'll walk through the Act as it, as it exists, as it currently is, and um, I will discuss the, the main points of the review that have come up um, as they thread through the discussion of the Act as it operates and, and a lot of the proposed changes rather than you know, current and review. And then after that, um, Hans will um, briefly uh, talk to you about how you can get involved and what you can do. And then um, I think both of us will um, stand up here and take questions so you can decide who it is that you want to um, ask a question of. And if we could just save the questions for the end, thanks. And I'll just uh, you know, run through things. Okay, so the Animal Welfare Act in New Zealand was uh, passed into law in 1999. And in the, the Hansards, the parliamentary debates, it was made pretty clear that a very significant motivation for passing this act, um, its predecessor was a, was a really archaic piece of legislation from the uh, 50s, um, or a combination of acts from the 50s and 60s and so on, and it put them all together into one new um, act in 1999. Um, and front and center, uh, the, of the consideration of the parliamentarians who put it through um, was New Zealand's export reputation. It was considered to be essential, to be very, very important that uh, New Zealand, because about 50% of New Zealand's GDP comes from animal and animal use industries. So that's about $21.2 billion a year. And yet, uh, when it comes to actually assuring our export markets, uh, and people overseas, and indeed within New Zealand, of our welfare standards, the total budget for all welfare in uh, New Zealand, for all animal welfare, is just over $6 million, which sounds like a big sum of money, but that is less than 1% of the Ministry for Primary Industries annual appropriations. And it's 0.007% of the national budget of the country in one year. So only a, a tiny, tiny amount. Of, um, of available money is actually spent on animal welfare. So there was a real focus on having at the front end of the Act something that looked very impressive and that sets very, very high standards. But what we'll find is that a little further on in the Act, sort of tucked into the, in the Act, sorry, and then sort of tucked into the boring middle, um, is, are these massive exemptions, these, these huge loopholes that apply to pretty much all industrial uh, exploitation or use of animals in New Zealand. But we'll get onto that in due course. So look, first of all, the Act and all the Animal Welfare Act and any Welfare Act purports to do is to prevent cruelty. It is assumed that animals will be used um, in industry, that they can be kept uh, captive, that they have no rights of their own, um, or that despite being living, sentient, thinking beings that can experience joy and pain and happiness and have their own cultures and communicate with each other and so on, in law they have the status only of property. So in law if someone um, shoots a dog 
uh, then the only, the only redress you can get against that person, assuming that it was done quickly and the animal didn't unduly suffer when it becomes a cruelty offence, but as long as it's done quickly, then the only claim you have against that person is for the monetary value of the dog. So it's really no different to breaking a valuable lamp that someone owns or something like that. So that is the legal status of all non-human animals and in fact all non-human nature um, in our system of law and indeed in, in any system of law um, you'll be able to find them with very few exceptions. Um, so I put this up, this rather colourful image here is of the trial of Bill Burns in 1822 under the first piece of cruelty, anti-cruelty legislation in the world and this painting hangs on the wall of the SPCA headquarters or the Royal Society for the Pre Prevention of Cruelty to Animals headquarters in London. Um, and it is the, um, the actual, the trial, the court case where a donkey that was being beaten in a, in a market and then was severely beaten was actually brought in as evidence. So I just thought it's this crazy image of this donkey being dragged into, into the court. And that was a successful prosecution that was brought by the MP uh, who actually passed that piece of legislation. But the point to get about an, a welfare act is that all it does is prevent cruelty. That's the only point. So the property status and um, the, the fact that we can, or, or the recognition that we can use animals in whatever way we wish, so long as we're not unduly cruel about it, or as the standard is, as we'll see, unreasonably or, or, or unfairly cruel about it. So that can allow considerable and quite shocking cruelty. But as long as you don't overstep those bounds, it's assumed that animals are our property to use. So the Animal Welfare Act was passed with great fanfare in 1999 um, with words like those of, these are drawn directly from the Hansards, the parliamentary debates, where the Minister for Agriculture at the time, John Luxton, said this was momentous legislation and a significant change in philosophy. Jill Pettis, um, an MP at the time, said that it signified us being a, a sophisticated and developed country. Um, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, there was really front and centre of consideration whilst demonstrating that New Zealand is a country with high animal welfare standards. Um, and there's been talk for, for many years successively, for the last you know, 30 years or so, or 20 years or so since it's been passed, that New Zealand has some of the highest animal welfare standards in the world. And on the front, the early part of the Act, that's certainly true. And in fact, encodes what are broadly recognised as the, the, four, the, pardon me, the five freedoms. Freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury and disease, freedom to express normal behaviour, very significant, freedom from pain and distress. So this is the real charter of, of how animals should be treated and what is uh, recognised the five freedoms around the world as the ideal for how animals should be treated and looked after. And in fact we see that passed pretty much directly into section four of the Act, where we see those five freedoms passed in right there. You'll notice that I highlight in the, in the ones to follow the likelihood of unreasonable or unnecessary pain or distress. So what's the logical corollary of that is that there is reasonable and necessary pain and distress that animals will experience. That's taken for granted. That's the underlying assumption. So the only way you can really fall afoul of the act when normal use or killing becomes unreasonable or unnecessary, or, or that's, that's when it becomes cruelty, and that's when you fall afoul of the act, but a lot can happen before then. I think probably the best way to experience this, this sort of odd line that's drawn by the law is a, is a very memorable case uh, from the very early 2000s of uh, two farmers who had a, a long-running and acrimonious uh, dispute that had gone on for years between them. And these two ended up absolutely hating each other. And one day, it was an argument over where a fence was, which accounts for an astonishingly high proportion of civil litigation in New Zealand. But anyway, so they had this massive ongoing fight about the fence being a few metres in the wrong direction. To prove a point one day, one of the farmers took a high-powered hunting rifle, sighted up the dog of the other farmer, and shot it clean through the head. Now, he was brought up um, on, on the cruelty charge and also on a firearm offence. And he successfully defended the cruelty charge because there was a vet who gave evidence that a high-powered rifle 
going right through the dog's head at close range would have destroyed its brain instantly, that it wouldn't have experienced any pain, and hence wasn't cruel, so he hadn't broken the law. Um, but he was done on the firearms offence, you know, the irresponsible use. But that case right there illustrates pretty much exactly where we are, that you can do exactly what you want, even to prove a rhetorical point. You can do whatever you want with an animal as long as you're not cruel. You might owe that person some money, the value of the animal, but as long as you haven't prolonged it, as long as it, it hasn't been unreasonable or unnecessary, uh, then you're okay. But look at this, section four, I mean, this is, this is wonderful stuff. So when we have these kind of standards, how is it then that we have uh, three to five birds, chickens, crammed into, into a small cage with barely room even to stretch their wings and standing on wire floors? How is it we can have pigs and sour crates? How is it we can have uh, how is it we can have dairy cows that suffer from mastitis and have their young taken away from them and killed and experience um, severe psychological distress? They're very clever animals, at least as intelligent as a dog, some theorists think more, um, that have their young torn away from them and experience intense psychological distress as well as the incredible physical discomfort, their shortened lives and so on that they suffer. How can that happen when we have such high standards encoded in the act? Section 10 of the Act. Um, section 9 is the purposes, and I'll touch on some significant bits of that, but I don't want to spend too long trawling through quotes of the legislation, so we'll get to that as it's important. But Section 10, the obligations in relation to the physical health and behavioural needs of animals, that the owner of an animal and every person in charge of an animal <coughs> must ensure the physical, physical health and behavioural needs, behavioural needs of an animal. You know, so that's everything right down to whether it can actually act and live naturally and normally, not be kept in close confinement, as a, as a pretty obvious example. That's in accordance with good practice and scientific knowledge. So, so far, so good. We have these really impressive high standards that we can hold up to, to the rest of the world and any export markets and say, in New Zealand, we take animal welfare seriously. Section 11, the obligation to alleviate pain and distress of ill or injured animals. Um, so how is it then, when we have these sorts of obligations, uh, when an animal is ill or injured, um, uh, and that, um, that any unreasonable or unnecessary pain or distress, so there are lots of practices, you know, the incidences of, of um, teeth infections from uh, dairy cows, the way they're milked, uh, the docking and mulesing of animals, removal of horns, removal of tails, all that sort of stuff that's done, a lot of the ways that, um, you know, uh, the, Domestic animals are treated as well. Um, you know, trimming of ears, docking of tails, all that sort of stuff, declawing, debarking, these things. Um, how can they be accepted as well when we have these kind of standards? Well, this is where we begin to see how this is possible. Under Section 13.2 uh, of the Animal Welfare Act, it is a defence in any prosecution under for a cruelty offence if the defendant proves that there was a code of welfare, a code of welfare in place. Now, codes of welfare are what's called tertiary legislation. So there's primary legislation, which is a law, like the Animal Welfare Act, that's primary legislation. Then there's secondary uh, legislation, like regulations. And there's a good reason for those, because you can't possibly write primary legislation that covers every single possible instance that the law will need to cover. So secondary legislation and tertiary legislation is useful because it doesn't need to go through a whole lengthy parliamentary process. It can be done relatively quickly by smaller groups of people. But what the codes of welfare allow, or what they establish, is minimum standards um, that are established. Um, and as long as the person who is being charged for the cruelty offence uh, can demonstrate that those minimum standards have been equaled or exceeded, then that is a complete defense for any cruelty charge. So who makes these codes? That's the question. It's a body called the National Animal Welfare Advisory Council. So the Animal Welfare Advisory Council. Bear that part of their title and job description in mind as I, as I step you through the sort of logic that they employ in coming up with these standards, um, otherwise known as NAWAC. So who's on NAWAC? Well, this is, the, this is the composition of NAWAC. It might be a bit small for you to read, and you certainly don't need to take in all this detail, but I did want to put this in front of you 
um, so that I could just go through and, and read out the professions of the people, their, their core professional competencies of the people who actually decide the animal welfare standards that millions of farmed and domestic animals in New Zealand are kept under. Um, top of the list, a senior lecturer in economics, a chartered accountant, a CEO. Um, we have a couple of vets. We have Don Nicholson, the former president of Federated Farmers. Um, and we have a few more vets and another accountant. Um, there is only one ethicist on the list. There's only one person who has a rigorous and specialised training in, in ethics and, and who, could, who could perhaps reasonably be said to be um, specialised in and primarily uh, on that group of people uh, from the perspective of, or, or to propound the perspective of animal welfare and ethics. So we've got two accountants, a CEO, an economics lecturer. The thing about, about um, the way a lot, of, a lot of vets are trained, or that vets are trained, is that, particularly uh, vets that are operating at this sort of level, is that uh, a large part of their training, um, and this is natural, this is no great indictment of, of them as people, but the professional training of a vet is focused on their role in facilitating animal use industries. That's their job, is to make animals productive and to get the most from those animals. So a very large part of their training in any profession that you want to take, be it lawyer, doctor, vet, whatever, there is, um, there is always the, the hidden curriculum uh, you know, that takes place, or, or just the understandings that, that you need to, that you um, are, are trained in and, and are run through, um, where you realize or, or where you're taught what is your appropriate professional role within the profession that you inhabit. Um, and, and the way you're meant to think. And the role of veterinarians is, is primarily, or, or their, their frame of thinking, and there will be obvious exceptions, but their frame of thinking is generally um, to facilitate agricultural industry and animal use industries. So we're not seeing a particularly strong representation of ethicists, or people whose, whose first and primary focus is animal welfare. Now this, this section here, 73 two, se section 73 is where it all happens. And this is, this is the last set of, of legislative provisions I'll, I'll run you through. So thanks for hanging in there so far. But this is important stuff because this is the sort of, this is the hidden code and where you can get these massive exceptions to what we saw up front in those very high standards of the act and how, and then the loopholes that are available for people to get around that. And bear in mind that these are, these are loopholes, these are exceptions that apply to pretty much all commercial use and, and farming industries. So, so you know, millions of animals in New Zealand, the vast majority of animals in New Zealand, are kept in conditions where the minimum stands, standards are set significantly lower than what is allowed under the main provisions of the Act. Uh, so the matters to be considered are <coughs> Good practice and scientific knowledge in relation to the management of the animals. <coughs> Available technology and any other matters considered relevant by the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee. Um, but that, that discretion indeed, that any other matters, is as a matter of, of public law and statutory interpretation, is not the incredibly broad ambit of just whatever else we think um, that it may look like. It actually has to be read relatively narrowly and consistent with the purposes of the Act, which are, which are back at the top in Section 9, um, such as um, attending properly to the welfare of animals and requiring persons in charge of animals to take, quote, all reasonable steps to ensure that the physical health and behavioural needs of animals are met in accordance with good practice and scientific knowledge. So that, or any other matters, has to be read very narrowly, um, relevant to those, to those purposes that focus on the welfare of the animal. Now, one thing that's been proposed in the review is that a new list, or a couple of extra factors, are added to this list of, of mandatory, or that is, that is compulsory considerations. Um, and they propose to add uh, practicality and economic considerations. Now, we'll see that those considerations are included further down in the exceptional circumstances provision 
So, so we've got the, the codes of welfare and, the, and the, the, um, in the previous section there, what is meant to be considered by NAWAC. You know, so it's good practice, scientific knowledge, etc., and other matters that are relevant to those purposes of promoting the welfare of animals. But, and here is the massive loophole that you could drive a bus through, is the exceptional circumstances clause. In exceptional circumstances, it is possible to have minimum standards and recommendations for best practice that do not fully meet, or in some cases do not even come close to meeting, those obligations up the front of section 10 or 11, those outward facing parts of the act that are, that are right there at the front which everybody sees that lay out the five freedoms and these very high standards. But it's possible there's a great big back door of exceptional circumstances where you don't have to meet those frontline considerations of animal welfare. So what do these sorts of exceptional considerations look like? Well, in making recommendations under this subsection, they can look at feasibility and practicality. They can look at uh, the requirements of religious and cultural practices. Um, and, and this one is all important, economic effects of any transition from current practices to new practices. And this is where we find that the debate around, for a good current example, the layer hen code, and how is it that we're still having these, all these birds that are stuffed into these tiny cages? How is that allowed? How can that continue to happen? And the argument is centered almost, almost, almost solely around economic effects, around farmers talking about the cost of compliance and how much more they're going to have to spend on new cages, or the economic viability and the practicality of getting rid of cages altogether. Uh, so the economic effects um, are something that takes real primacy. And they're already there in the law for the consideration of, of what would be exceptional circumstances. So whatever you thought exceptional circumstances might mean, that they'd be something exceptional, well actually, if somebody can make a reasonable argument to NAWAC that um, they will suffer economic distress or difficulties or that it will become economically inefficient uh, for them to work as they do, um, or that it's, it's, it's not feasible or it's not practical in their view and they can source enough, you know, enough reports and information to back that up, then that can trump, that makes it exceptional then. Well, guess what? Pretty much every group of, of producers, and these are well-resourced groups, um, is able to find these sorts of reasons. And they are able to make the case that they are exceptional. But it gets better because NAWAC has responsibility for drafting the codes. But under the Act, the, um, anybody can submit a draft. So anybody can actually submit a recommended code to NAWAC for consideration. So guess who has the time, the resource, the energy, and the commitment to draft those codes and submit them to NAWAC? What you end up with is a, um, a code for dairy cattle that's written primarily by dairy producers. You have the Egg Producers Federation having very substantial input into, mm -hmm. if not drafting, the first copies of uh, the Code of Welfare for layer heads. Um, and, and making those arguments, paying for the consultants and the, and the researchers and, and coming up with the evidence to prove that it's going to be difficult, the sky's going to fall in because it's going to cost too much and New Zealanders will be paying $12 an egg and it's a social justice issue if you think about it really because everybody needs cheap eggs, etc., etc., and how much it's going to cost them as producers. Um, and you end up with a starting point um, that has been drafted by the industry, by producers, and is obviously, you know, given that it's an adversarial sort of setup, you know, that they, they draft something that, that suits their interests, and then it's the job of NAWAC to come in and sort of moderate that a bit and pull it back a bit, but you do essentially end up with something that can be a bit of a producer's charter, really, um, being the codes. Now bear in mind that the economic effects and practicality that are now proposed to go um, way further up, back up in those mandatory considerations. Um, so they're, they're su the, the suggestion is that they go in here, that they go into consideration for all codes. So if that were to be the case, then you wouldn't even have to make the argument, you wouldn't even have to make the case that your circumstances are somehow exceptional. Um, that practicality and economic feasibility um, would become actually compulsory considerations 
They would have to be considered in all codes, no matter what. And it would actually be, it would be wrong of NAWAC in drafting the code not to consider the economic impact. That would be the difference. So we see those already, already in the law, but they're only in the exceptional circumstances part. So there's a, there's a real concern, um, and, and SAFE has submitted in detail on this uh, in the review, that this would become actually part of the general considerations. So that's a real worry there. So what we have then is, um, is a system where um, already uh, practical effects of feasibility and economic considerations are, um, are front and centre. And actually in the consultations that um, some of us attended, um, representatives of the MPI said, well look, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's only right for us to put that in, in the section there as a mandatory consideration. It's a matter of transparency. We need to be honest with the public because we consider these things anyway. It's a very frank admission. So they're suggesting that, look, we think like this anyway, so you know, we really should just put it in the act and then it's clear for everybody. There's a real concern though, is that we'll end up with quite a bit of mission creep, you know, once it's in that section, what's to stop those considerations making it into, into sections nine and 10? What's to stop them from getting into the primary purpose parts of the act as well? There's nothing to stop that, essentially. All they would need to do is get it past Parliament. So the NAWAC guidelines, the other things they look at, here we go. It's, um, and it's always around the bottom of the list, but economic implications for those concerned. And no weighting is given on, these, on this list. So perhaps if we were to look at the, the weightings that are actually given in their deliberations, this one would be in about 30 point, <laughs> as opposed to eight and 10 and 12 point for these others. Now this is not to say, that there isn't, there isn't a genuine commitment uh, on, on the part of the board to meet, um, of, of the advisory committee, sorry, to meet um, high veterinary scientific welfare standards. You know, there is a commitment to doing that. You know, I don't want to come across as overly or completely cynical about their role, but there is a very, very heavy weighting um, in one direction. Um, and also, this is a committee that has a huge amount of work to do, very, very important work, that affects millions of animals, um, but is, is severely under-resourced. They have an allocation of it's around about $140,000 a year, um, from which all research um, and, and all of the, all, and the, and the, um, the payment for those, those 12 people and their, their work and their involvement um, actually is. And actually, that's, that's, that's like all research, all writing, all work. So, so very little of that actually goes to them for their work. And they have a very short amount of time to do this work as well. Um, in the guidelines that um, the NAWAC publish, um, they say that they're not engaged in formulating codes based on international trends or public opinion polls, um, but that economics may constrain the speed of implementation of a change um, that NAWAC desires, and indeed may prevent it altogether. So it's, it's pretty hard to find anything that, that NAWAC uses guidance for their decisions that isn't shot through with economic considerations. Um, now, of course, this is always, this is always said to be balanced. Now, that this is a balanced approach. And I, and I found this, uh, this graphic, which I thought was well, a bit of a laugh, because <coughs> it sort of gives this idea. It reminds me a bit of, um, of a, if anyone's seen An Inconvenient Truth, and Al Gore puts up the scales that have you know, the entire world and the economy. Something a bit like that. You, know, you have the actual rights of the animal, um, balanced against the other considerations of economics, efficiency, food safety, etc. Um, and that, you know, there's this scientific sort of mediation of, of, of supposedly balancing um, those two approaches. So, another major proposal that has come out of the review is to have regulations instead of codes. Now, regulations are stronger, certainly, um, than a code. Because remember that the code and the minimum standards of the codes are only a defense to a charge of cruelty. So they're not directly enforceable themselves. And what you have to do is bring a prosecution first before those codes and the defense therein meeting the minimum standards even comes into effect. So the problem with this, of course, is that very little money is allocated to enforcement and prosecution. Um, in fact, in New Zealand, under the Act, uh, there are three groups of people who are responsible for enforcement, who are actually able to bring charges. 
a, uh, the Ministry for Primary Industries, whose role, whose charter and, and their success is judged on their successful facilitation of agricultural industry. And that's one of the larger sort of high level problems in fact with the animal welfare laws in New Zealand being enforced by a ministry whose prime responsibility, especially after the renaming, I mean that really deleted all ambiguity, didn't it? What is the role of the minister? And, and you know, a minister who's doing their job in that position, who's, who's meeting their job description, their role is primarily to facilitate agricultural industry. But of course, there's a real disconnect there between that person also being responsible for looking after animal welfare and seeing it as anything other than an impediment to improved or increased and high level agricultural production. So regulations are better than that. Oh, actually, first of all, so we've got the MPI and then we've got uh, the police are also empowered as well. But um, probably not surprisingly, don't have a particularly strong interest. Um, they're having a hard enough time looking after the, the charging investigations and prosecutions involving human animals, which means that pretty much all investigation and, and the only other body that is actually empowered to bring charges and prosecutions is the SPCA. The SPCA, which is a privately funded charity, which relies almost entirely on donations from the public. There was a one-off donation, uh, well, a one-off contribution from the government of $2 million um, that was spread over <coughs> a few years. Um, but that was a one-off thing. That was, that was it, as far as government funding. So what we have is this extremely hard-working body of people whose responsibility is to go out and investigate and bring prosecutions, um, many of whom aren't lawyers by training, who have to bring prosecutions that have to meet, and this is one of the other problems, a criminal standard of proof. See, the thing is that to, to charge someone for a cruelty offence, you have to meet the criminal standard. Now, the criminal standard, in law, there are a couple of standards of proof. Um, in, in civil litigation, uh, so that's you know, things that aren't criminal, it's a, what's called a balance of probabilities. So if, you, if it seems more than about 50% right, if you're 60% convinced uh, that or if a judge is, is, is about you know, 50 to 60% convinced, um, at least more than half that something is the case, then that's accepted as, as adequate, as sufficient for something to be proven. But the criminal standard is beyond reasonable doubt. That's an extremely high standard, and it puts a far greater burden on prosecutors. And what it means is that uh, the SPCA doesn't have limitless funds. Um, and they only have, they have a whole lot of other stuff that they're trying to do and that they're trying to achieve. And they only have a limited ability and funding to prosecute these offences. So what that means is that they're in, the, they're in the position then of only being able to prosecute, you know, the worst of the worst. The real sickos, you know, people who, who, are, who are torturing animals, you know, or, or really prolonged and, and gruesome cases of cruelty. Or people who have, who have neglected hundreds of animals. Um, and even a lot of them, um, you know, are, are never followed up on or investigated because there's only so much that a private charity that's funded purely by voluntary donations can actually do. And yet the entire burden, remember that this is, this is a group of industries that contributes half of our GDP, about over $21 billion, and all responsibility for the actual enforcement and prosecutions of animal welfare within that industry falls to a charity. So, it sounds very good then to say, to propose, as the, as the Ministry has, that we have regulations instead of codes, because the codes, as we know now, are, are only a defence. The minimum standards of the codes are a defence to a prosecution. But regulations are much stronger. Regulations are directly enforceable. Uh, regulations uh, will be drafted by the Parliamentary Council Office, so a very high standard of drafting. Um, that they have the, the buy-in, the support of cabinet, that's how regulations are passed, and that they're subject to the Regulations Review Committee of Parliament as well, which is a very powerful committee, although the codes are partly considered to be regulations as well, at least for the purposes of the Regulation Disallowance Act. And without getting into too many technicalities, I think that probably the, the weakness of that review power is demonstrated by what happened in 2006 when the Leia Hen Code was reviewed 
by the uh, Regulations Review Committee of Parliament, and they recommended to the Minister at the time, Jim Anderson, that the code be scrapped and rewritten because it's non-compliant with the law, and he ignored that advice, and the code stayed exactly as it was. So even that review possibility is not quite as promising as it may sound. But regulations, directly enforceable. This sounds really good, doesn't it? It sounds like this is the sort of thing that will get a great headline. And it sounds like the government is finally committing to getting really, really tough on animal welfare. But there are, there are also problems uh, with regulations. Um, and what became clear in the consultations was that what we were hearing from the ministry was that because regulations are directly enforceable, because regulations are a lot more powerful, then they can't be anywhere near as detailed and specific as the codes are. And it was suggested that, first of all, the minimum standards of the current codes would be used as the starting point, as the departure point for drafting those codes. Now, the minimum standards sound to you like a good place to start for drafting regulations. Bear in mind that a lot of these minimum standards as well have been reached through that back door of exceptional circumstances. So we've already got significantly compromised standards, and that's the starting point. So there's an issue there. And then from there, we're saying that, or the ministry is saying that, well, you know, only some of these can be given practical effects. So um, numbers as low as 5 10% from memory. Yeah, about 5% of the substantive material in the codes would actually make it into being regulations. And furthermore, that they would be a lot broader and that the regulations would have to be supplemented by voluntary guidelines, which are completely unenforceable and can be freely ignored. So we will have um, then, if, if this proposal goes through, a much smaller body of regulations, which are, yes, enforceable, but very, very broad and will be in categories like farmed animals. Okay, so you'll have a set of regulations that is sort of a broad catch-all um, that covers dairy farming, pig farming, chicken farming, llama farming, ostrich farming, you name it. And they're going to have to be, to cover all farmed animals, they're going to have to be sufficiently broad that none of the, of the very specific um, practices within any one of those industries are covered. But all of that will be covered by voluntary guidelines that people really should follow, you know, to do the right thing, but are completely legally unenforceable. So that's the concern about regulations. Regulations can be what can be a, a classic government initiative, a bit like increasing the maximum sentences, as a, as a, a member's bill from Simon Bridges did a few years ago, increasing the uh, maximum penalties for cruelty offences. Um, so for the, the, the main offence, or, or the, the, the worst offence of, of cruelty under the Animal Welfare Act, the maximum sentence was set at three years. And this private member's bill raised that maximum sentence to five years. This got lots of headlines. It was a champion for the animals. This government was really serious about animal cruelty. None of these reports really um, made the observation that if you read any sentencing support, uh, reports and actually looked at what had been the maximum sentences that were actually handed out, the most that had ever been handed out was one year. And that was only a very small part of that was actually served. Um, so you had a maximum of three years, and the highest sentence ever had been one year. So raising that ceiling higher is only going to create a bigger echo. So, but we've seen these sorts of moves, these things that sound great, that, that you know you can hold up and say, nobody can say that we're not serious about getting tough on animal welfare, but actually have very little practical effect. Um, so, so that's the concern, because they cost nothing, they sound great, and they have no practical effect. So that's our concern with regulations. There's also this massive loophole <coughs> in the Act. It's um, section 175, so this is tucked right in the back, regarding hunting. And what section 175 regarding hunting says is that the Act doesn't apply to anything that is hunting or killing. And it really is that broad. Um, no prosecutions have ever been brought under this section because anybody who's looked at doing it has just said, bearing in mind they have limited funds, time and resource to do this, they say, well, we've got 
this massive list of cruelty offenses that we know about, you know, and that we know we can actually prosecute for and have case law on. This is just uncharted territory, and nobody really knows what it means. And in fact, what became clear, I did a bit of looking around in the parliamentary debates to work out, well, how did they, did they really, did Parliament really intend to just put in this complete exemption, that as soon as you put on one of those, you know, camo jackets and, and, and step into the bush with a gun, that now no animal welfare law in New Zealand applies to you whatsoever. It's theoretically possible for you to inflict a death of a thousand cuts on an animal. You can just follow around and wound it just a little bit, you know? Um, you, can, you can freely set a pack of dogs on a wild pig, for instance. You can take a huge amount of time, um, you know, reeling in a fish far longer than it takes and inflicting huge suffering. Um, you know, you can do all sorts of stuff like that. And as long as it's hunting and killing, then it's not captured within the act. What became clear looking at Hansard, looking at the parliamentary debates, was that that was something that had gone very much into the too hard basket. And, and that's pretty much what the MP said on the matter. That it was just something that, look, it was, it was, uh, there were very powerful and entrenched lobby groups around hunting. You know, like very well resourced people who were strongly committed to their right to hunt, to kill animals in the wild, um, who, were, who were having no truck whatsoever with any proposed um, with any proposed introduction of standards as to how they do that, any standard of, of necessity or reasonableness in how they did that. Um, and it wouldn't take too much to fix that either. Um, in Australia, for instance, um, the, they, there, are, um, there are codes that, or regulations that actually say that they import the reasonableness standard. And they, they just say stuff like that you can't do anything that's, that's unreasonable or, or unnecessary in killing an animal. So, and are a little more specific that the, you know, the, the caliber of the weapon and the distance you are from the animal has to be appropriate to affect a quick death. Now this is clear, this is readily enforceable, this is obvious to any observer, and yet this is too much for us to put in the Act um, or the regulations around hunting. So what we have is this blanket exemption at the moment, but it's not even fully intentional. It's just sort of this great big sort of too hard category that was left there. So any animal in a wild state ends up completely unprotected. So we end up with this odd hierarchy in New Zealand where we have, we have strongly protected native animals. You know, so woe betide you if you shoot a keredu or harm a kiwi or something like that. And hey, rightly so. So they're strongly protected. But any animal that happens to have the misfortune of being introduced rather than native, no standards whatsoever apply. And then different standards still are applied to domestic animals, you know, cats and dogs. But a lot of that is not really because of any recognition in the law, but more just because of how we feel about them. <laughs> Essentially, though, the main problem is not the rules. That a lot of the proposed changes that have been suggested um, will actually, rather than building on a strong foundation, which was which is the, the language um, at the head of the review document, um, a lot of the proposals will actually weaken the Act, will actually make it less powerful, even than it is now. Um, so it would be better, actually, <coughs> to leave the rules as they are, but actually put some money into enforcement. One thing that was made very, very clear um, in the consultations was there is and there will be no additional money put towards welfare. That was front and centre. That was made very, very clear to us that, look, don't even ask for or suggest that more money go to this because it's been made very clear that this is just not going to happen. It's not a priority. It's not a commitment. Um, so this tinkering with the rules, which may well make things weaker and certainly seems very, very unlikely to improve them, um, is really just tinkering around the periphery and may actually make the animal welfare law even, even harder to understand than it is. The fact that it's taken the best part of an hour to actually describe to you how the Act actually operates and how you have to read the whole thing all the way through, I think is some testament to the way it's been drafted, you know, and, and the fact that this Act has not been created, um, first and foremost, to be easily understandable and directly enforceable. It has been designed to allow massive and substantial uh, loopholes and exemptions for commercial producers in New Zealand. And that's the reality. 
So I guess that's ultimately, that's, that's the bottom line that I, I put across to you and, and, and sort of the feeling that I walk away from the review with is that actually it really isn't the rules, it's the enforcement. Put some money into it. Actually empower state actors to enforce the rules that we have would be the main thing. Now we have many other ideas, uh, you know, for positive reform, um, but that would be another hour. So perhaps we can bring those up in, in question time. And then also I should say that um, what I've told you tonight isn't a comprehensive uh, coverage of what was covered in the review, but it does cover the main proposals um, and in a way that highlights the weaknesses and the shortcomings of the current Act um, and the proposals um, that will affect the Act as it operates. The main ones that you really need to know about. Okay, so thanks a lot for your attention. I hope that's been interesting and informative. Actually, one last thing that I would like to put up is um, because layer hens is very much a live issue now, and that's something that I think we should all get really activist about if we can, you know, because in other parts of the world, um, there have been comprehensive bans on, on layer hens in cages. Here are just a few. Switzerland, 1992. They're pretty advanced, those Swiss. Sweden, 1999. These are complete bans, all forms of cage, whether it's, you know, so, so what we've had in New Zealand is a shift to, in, what is it, 20 years' time, um, people have to meet the standard of having a bigger cage. Um, so instead of a small cage that has three to five birds in it, you have a bigger one that has more birds in it, but it's got like a different type of floor and a, and a sort of a, a perch they can go on and some extra bits in the middle. But a cage is a cage, is a cage, is a cage. But these are the countries that have banned cages altogether. Switzerland, Sweden, Germany in 2007, Austria banned cages in 2008, and the enriched colonies, which is the euphemo uh, euphemism that's used for bigger cages, um, which are being introduced in New Zealand, uh, demanding compliance 10 years after that, are being banned altogether in Austria. So that's all forms of cage have been banned in all of these countries. And in the European Union, there's been a ban on cages um, effective 2012. Well, that's going to take quite a long time um, for compliance because some countries have been more serious and committed to that repeal than others. But they're still allowing colony cages, though. But they're still allowing colony cages, yeah. So that's... Um, Right, good, and that's an important point of clarification. But this is possible, this is doable, you know, and in none of these countries did the sky fall in, in none of these countries were people forced to stop eating eggs because they became so much more expensive. Uh, you know, this was all very manageable, um, and it was all, it was a thing that actually many producers used as a point of difference. They were keen to be the first to adopt it. And perhaps this is the sort of thing that, that New Zealand more broadly uh, should be thinking about is, is do we want to continue to be engaged in a, in a race to the bottom in terms of environmental and animal welfare standards with other countries of the world to produce the, the cheapest possible eggs with the runniest yellowest oaks and to take what is arguably the finest dairy in the world, abuse cows horribly for their short lifetime so that we can dig up lignite from Southlands to belch out carbon emissions to produce, take what is arguably the finest dairy in the world boil all the water out of it in furnaces and turn it into uh, milk powder that's in unmarked plastic bags and is pretty much the same as any milk powder from anywhere else in the world, or would it make more sense? Would there be a broader sort of coherent economic vision rather than being engaged in this race to the bottom to actually take environmental and animal welfare standards forward? This isn't an expense, this isn't a cost, this isn't a hindrance. And that's the problem with a purely economic approach to things, of course, is that you see the cost of everything and the value of nothing. So the thing that I'd suggest to you is not only is this the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. Okay, so I'll leave it there.